This morning, I would like to begin by showing you a clip from the 1990s sci-fi series Babylon 5. And I do understand that not everyone likes science fiction or stories about space and aliens. My suggestion to you would be to remember that these are actors with maybe a little more makeup and latex in their face than the regular ones, okay? Um, just to give you the context of what you will see in a nutshell. The main character of this video excerpt is called Jakar. He's from a race of alien called the Narn. And Jakar kept a personal diary uh, during a time of war with the, another alien race. And for some reason, his diary is made public and people of his race start to read it and overnight, Jakar becomes, against his will, some sort of a spiritual slash religious guru. And, and Narns from everywhere start to, to flock to him and come to listen to him. And most importantly, they have questions about the book he wrote. This might be science fiction, but just try to imagine Jesus coming back today, answering questions about the gospel from good Christians. So, let us watch. In the past, we have had little to do with other races. Evolution teaches us that we must fight that which is different in order to secure land, food, and mates for ourselves. But we must reach a point where the nobility of intellect asserts itself and says no. We need not be afraid of those who are different. We can embrace that difference and learn from it. Most holy. There is no most holy here. There is only me. What is it? I understand what you are saying. But in the book of Jakar, it says that the Centauri cannot be trusted. When was that written in the book? In the beginning. Exactly. Over time I learned, as you will learn. The book of Jakar is holy. If it was written under the direct inspiration of the universe itself, as everyone believes it to be, then the whole of it must be true. How then can you go against it? Show me the passage in the book. Good, good. Now, put your face in the book. If the book is holy and I am holy, then I must help you become closer to the thoughts of the universe. Put your face in the book. <laughs> the first thing we are all taught is that while outsiders cannot be trusted, we can always trust a fellow Norn, yes? This is your point, is it not? Good. Then put your face in the book. There's lesson number one. Honestly, I wish I had the courage to do that on some occasion, you know. <laughs> United Church of Canada is considered a liberal Christian denomination with progressive theologies. And I use the plural here on purpose because we don't just have one theology, we have many ones that are accepted. And sometimes we have conversation with some of our brothers and sisters in faith who are more traditionalists or conservative or who are reading uh, the scripture literally. And I don't know about you, but I find those moments often frustrating. Some of them will show up with their King James Bible with uh, the words of Jesus written in red as if Jesus 
spoke in the 16th uh, century uh, Elizabeth then English. And they will base their entire argument or reasoning against, uh, I don't know, ordination of women, uh, abortion, equal marriage, by quoting uh, Roman 10, 1 Timothy 2, Leviticus 18. Of course, they rarely quote Leviticus 11, verse 8, that says, you shall not eat pigs and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean because they would not be able to eat bacon while watching a good football game, you know, just saying. Now, during those conversations, sometimes, most of the time, I'm wondering if these individuals believe in God or if they believe in the Bible. I'm wondering what is more important for them, God's message for the people or the ink on pages of a book. And this is probably how Jesus felt in today's gospel passage when he, had, when he has yet another time an argument with the religious establishment of his time. Some would say, oh, that's nothing you hear, no big deal. It's, it seems that arguing was Jesus' thing, you know. Well, this case is a little special because it's the first and only occasion in the Gospel according to Luke that Jesus engaged a group called the Sadducees. <coughs> Sorry. And these men, yes, they were men, who, these men who came from the um, priestly families, the aristocracy, higher society, were more conservative than the famous Pharisee we find other places in the Gospel. They were, in fact, the literalists of their time in society. They believe only in what they can find and, and read in the Torah, uh, the first five books of our Bible, five books which are yes, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Deuteronomy. So, if a topic is mentioned in one of those books, like uh, sacrifice of animals for the Holy One, it's religiously acceptable for the Sadducees. If it comes from another source, even from the great prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah, not good. They would reject it. Well, the Sadducees had noticed the presence of this new young rabbi named Jesus who was teaching in the temple every day. People liked him, a significant crowd constantly surrounds him. Yeah. However, Jesus seems to believe in the resurrection of the death, a topic that is definitely not found in the first book of the Bibles. So the Sadducees decide to entrap Jesus with the net of his own word by going to the political juggler, a question about marriage. And once again, humankind hasn't changed much in the last 2,000 years. Religious people seem to be always been obsessed by marriage question. Anyway, so the Sadducees bring to Jesus, a question that was surely going around these days to expose, from their point of view, the absurdity of the idea of resurrection. So, Jesus, my friend, they say, we have a question for you about the leveret marriage. Leveret, from the word levir, which means brother-in-law in Latin a language that none of us are speaking, but for the sake of this minister who will write a sermon in 2,000 years, let's just pretend, okay? So, you're surely aware, my friend Jesus, that the book of Deuteronomy says, and I quote, when brothers reside together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go to her, taking her in marriage and performing the duty of an husband brother to her. And the firstborn whom she bears shall succeed to the name of the deceased brother. 
Well, Jesus, I think we can all agree that it's a bit weird, but it's in the good book, so no argument here. Well, this is our question. There was a man who married and died childless, and his brother did the right thing, married the widow, and also died childless. And then the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh brother married the poor widow, and everybody died childless. So tell us, Jesus, hmm, 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 in this resurrection of yours, whose wife will be the women, since all the brother married her? Eh? 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 How do you make sense of this, Jesus? Do hmm? 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 you know what? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Mm -hmm. No, the Sadducees are sure, are sure they have Jesus exactly where they wanted him. They're convinced that he cannot walk up this theological quicksand with his integrity intact. This is what they think. But Jesus, who was not his first debate, answers by highlighting the difference between the law and God. And this is relevant for us too, like the Sadducees. All of us can spend months and, and years studying scripture, learning by heart countless verses and, and analyzing each and single coma in a text and still completely miss the whole point of our Bible. We can build beautiful churches, structure relevant faith group and denominations, and print fancy Bible. And the fact remains that God cannot be boxed or restricted in one single book, time frame, cultural context, or even building. God is bigger than what we can understand or imagine. God who created in the past is still creating today. And Jesus reminds us that God is not a God of the dead, but a God of the living. Of course, history, traditions, exegesis of biblical texts and past wisdom are important. Yes, of course, but not to the point to give a religious veto to people who have died more than 300 years ago. The fact is, we do not live our faith in a, a bubble or in a vacuum, but in the real world with real people who has real concerns and challenges. What would be the point, tell me, to memorize a whole Bible if we fail to love God and love our neighbors? How can we claim to be disciples of Jesus the Christ if we do not help those in need and work for the improvement on the condition of every human being? How can we proclaim the unbounded love of God for everyone and then exclude some of our brothers and sisters from our worship space because of a few words or a sentence in a book? To believe in the living God, it's not easy. In fact, it might be more difficult than people imagine because it requires us to challenge our assumption constantly, as well as our faith and also ourselves. Every day we are asked to discover where God brings newness in this world. Who needs to hear a message of liberation? When should we adapt to our culture and circumstances, ancient life-giving words? Which prophetic voices do we ought to listen? What innovation can allow ourselves to go deeper in our faith, our belief, and our spirituality, so we can put flesh on the hope of the people of God? probably heard the famous expression, what would Jesus do if he was here today? Well, what would he say about the way we read our Bible and the way we try to be the body of Christ together? 
and as one of the people of the very liberal United Church of Canada, I do not believe that we need to get rid of our Bibles. No, we need to keep them. We don't get rid of them because they're outdated, too restrictive, or, or have been used as a weapon against other Christians. No, no, we keep them. And we need them as a tool to understand and discover how God speak in the present tense, today. Our God is not the God of the death or the God of our single book but the God of the living, right here, right now. For this, thanks be to God, and Amen.